Hi everyone, my name is Leticia and I'm coming to you from Australia. I'm specifically located in the Yarra Valley in the state of Victoria. That might be something interesting that you can look up on the internet and find out a little bit about the Yarra Valley. So I'm going to chapter by chapter read to you a book called the seven or seven little Australians. I added the word the, it's not there. Seven Little Australians by Ethel Turner. This book was originally published in 1894. 1894, that's right. So it's very, very old. So one of the cool things about this if you're not from Australia, there's probably going to be a few words and terms in here that you're not familiar with. Or even if you are from Australia, there's probably going to be some words and terms in here that you're not familiar with because this book is really old. So if you're one of the kids that are home from school right now and you're working from home, I'm going to give a few questions to you, 10 in all, during this first chapter. So before we even start reading the book, let's go with question number one, okay? So pause me right here if you need to go get a pen and pencil. No, a pen and paper <laughs> or pencil and paper. Stuff to write with and on, okay? So what I want you to do, question number one is, how many years ago was Seven Little Australians written? Okay, so it was written in 1894. Okay, so write that down, 1894. So how do you think you could figure out how long it's been? If you're watching this in 2020, you could subtract 1894 from 2020 and tell me how long it's been. Write that down on your answers, okay? So, Seven Little Australians, again, written by Ethel Turner, and she dedicates this book to her mother. Now, this is chapter one, and there are 22, I already forgot, 22 chapters in all. So, let's get started, okay? Chapter one is called Chiefly Descriptive. Before you fairly start this story, I should like to give you just a word of warning. That's a tongue twister. Word of warning. If you imagine you are going to read of model children with perhaps a naughtily inclined one to point a moral, you had better lay down the book immediately and betake yourself to Sanford and Merton or similar standard juvenile works. Not one of the seven is really good for the very excellent reason that Australian children never are. In England and America and Africa and Asia, the little folks may be paragons of virtue. I know little about them. But in Australia, a model child is, I say it not without thankfulness, an unknown quantity. It may be that the miasmas of naughtiness develop best in the sunny brilliancy of our atmosphere. And that's actually question number two, if you have your pen and paper handy. Miasmas, that's a word I've never heard before. So question number two is looking up the definition of the word miasmas. I think it's actually miasmas, pardon me, miasmas. M-I-A-S-M-A-S, -A -A miasmas, okay, so. As a go back a little here, it may be that the miasmas, miasmas of naughtiness develop best in the sunny brilliancy of our atmosphere. It may be that the land and the people are young hearted together and the children's spirits not crushed and saddened by the shadow of long years sorrowful history. There is a lurking sparkle of joyousness and rebellion and mischief in nature here and therefore in children. Often the light grows dull and the bright coloring fades to neutral tints in the dust and heat of the day. But when it survives play days and school days, circumstances alone determine whether the electric sparkle shall go to play, willow the wisp with the larrikin type, or warm the breasts of the spirited, single-hearted loyal ones who alone can advance Australia. 
remember to be to uh, blah, 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 remember for me to get back to that at the end about advance Australia. But there was probably a word you heard in there, larrikin. That's gonna be one of your words to write down. L a r r a k i n. Have you ever heard that word before? What do you think that means? It was talking about the larrikin type. Okay, enough of such talk. Let me tell you about my seven select spirits. They are having nursery, they are having nursery tea at the present moment with a minimum of comfort and a maximum of noise. So if you can bear a deafening babble of voices and an unmusical clitter clatter of crockery, I will take you inside the room and introduce you to them. Nursery tea is, a, is more an English institution than an Australian one. There is a kind of bone camaraderie feeling between parents and young folks here and an utter absence of veneration on the part of the latter. So even in the most wealthy families, it seldom happens that the parents dine in solemn state alone while the children are having a simple tea in another room. They all assemble around the same board and the young ones partake of the same dishes and sustain their parts in the conversation right nobly. But given a very particular and rather irritable father and seven children with excellent lungs and tireless tongues what could you do but give them separate rooms to take their meals in? Captain Woolcott, the father, in addition to this division, had had thick felt put over the swing door upstairs, but the noise used to float down to the dining room in a cheerful, unconcerned manner, despite it. It was a nursery without a nurse, too, so that partly accounted for it. Meg, the eldest, was only 16 and could not be expected to be much of a disciplinarian. And the slatternly but good-natured girl, who was supposed to combine the duties of nursery maid and housemaid, had so much to do in her second capacity that the first suffered considerably. She used to lay the nursery meals when none of the little girls could be found to help her and bundle on the clothes of the two youngest in the morning. But beyond that, the seven had to manage for themselves. The mother, you ask? Oh, she was only 20, just a lovely laughing faced girl whom they all adored and who was very little steadier and very little more of a housekeeper than Meg. Only the youngest of the brood was hers, but she seemed just as fond of the other six as of it and treated it more as if it were a very entertaining kitten rather than a real live baby and her very own. Indeed, at Misrule, that is the name of their house always went by, though I believe there was a different one painted above the balcony, that baby seemed a gigantic joke to everyone. The captain generally laughed when he saw it, tossed it in the air, and then asked someone to take it quickly. Okay, so Number four, did you hear the name of the house? It said its nickname was Misrule, M-I-S-R-U-L-E, but that it actually has a different official name. Why do you think? Have you heard anything so far that would make you, give you an idea of why it might be called Misrule instead of its real name? Maybe you could write down a couple of ideas, maybe three or four different ideas of why you think it's called misrule. Okay, so back to the new little baby. The children dragged it all over the country with them, dropped it countless times, forgot its police on wet days, muffled it up when it was hot, gave it the most astounding things to eat, and yet, it was the healthiest, prettiest, and most sunshiny baby that ever sucked a wee fat thumb. Hmm, there was another word in there that I've never heard before. Police. Sounds like the other children put police, a police, or forgot a police. They didn't put it on, they forgot the police. P-E-L-I-S-S-E. -S -S -E. That would be a really good word to look up too. And that was number five. 
It was never called Baby either. That was the special name of the next youngest. Captain Wolcott had said, Hello, is this the general? When the little red staring-eyed morsel had been put into his arms and the name had come into daily use. Though I believe at the christening service, the curate did say something about Francis Rupert Bernard Wolcott. Baby was four and was a little soft fat thing with pretty cuddlesome ways, great smiling eyes and lips very kissable when they were free from jam. She had a weakness, however, for making the general cry or she would have been really almost a model child. Innumerable times she had been found pressing its poor little chest to make it squeak and even pinching its tiny arms or pulling its innocent nose just for the strange pleasure of hearing the yells of despair it instantly set up. Captain Woolcott ascribed the peculiar tendency to the fact that the child had once had a dropsical looking woolly lamb from which the utmost pressure would only elicit the faintest possible squeak. He said it was only natural that now she had something so amenable to squeezing, she would want to utilize it. Bunty was six and was fat and very lazy. He hated scouting at cricket. He loathed the very name of a paper chase. And as for running an errand, why, before anyone could finish saying something was wanted, he would have utterly disappeared. He was rather small for his age, and I don't think had ever been seen with a clean face. Even at church, though the immediate front turned to the minister might be passable, the people in the next pew had always an uninterrupted view of the black rim where washing operations had left off. The next on the list, I am going from youngest to oldest, you see, was the show Woolcott, as Pip, the eldest boy, used to say. You have seen those exquisite child angel faces on Raphael Tuck's Christmas cards? I think the artist must have just dreamed of Nell and then reproduced the vision imperfectly. She was 10 and had a little fairy-like figure, gold hair clustering in wonderful waves and curls around her face, face, not face, <laughs> and soft hazel eyes and a little rosebud of a mouth. She was not conceited either. Her family took care of that. Pip would have nipped such a weakness very sternly in its earliest bud. But in some way, if there was a pretty ribbon to spare or a breath of bright material, just enough for one little frock, it fell as a matter of course to her. Judy was only three years older, but was the greatest contrast imaginable. Nellie used to move rather slowly about and would have made a picture in any attitude. Judy, I think, was never seen to walk and seldom looked picturesque. If she did not dash madly to the place she wished to get to, she would progress by a series of jumps, bounds, and odd little skips. She was very thin, as people generally are who are quicksilver, instead of blood in their veins. She had a small, eager, freckled face with very bright, dark eyes a small determined mouth and a mane of untidy curly dark hair that was the trial of her life. Did you hear the word quicksilver in there? That's number six. So number six is to look up the word quicksilver. This one might cause a little bit of trouble, drop my paper, because it's also a brand name a brand of clothing, so you might have to do a little more searching to find out what Quicksilver means. But before you look it up, maybe you could think what the definition might be. So, said, she was very thin as people generally are who have Quicksilver instead of blood in their veins just previously talked about how she would get everywhere by a series of jumps, bounds, and odd little skips. So that's number six, Quicksilver. Without doubt, she was worse, the worst of the seven, probably because she was the cleverest. Her brilliant, inventive powers plunged them all into ceaseless scrapes 
and though she often bore the brunt of the blame with equanimity, they used to turn round, not infrequently, and upbraid her for suggesting the mischief. She had been christened Helen, which in no way accounts for Judy, but then nicknames are rather unaccountable things sometimes, are they not? Bunty said it was because she was always popping and jerking herself about like the celebrated wife of Punch, and there really is something in that. Her name, her other name, Fizz, is easier to understand. Pip used to say he never had seen the ginger ale that ever vest and bubbled and made the noise that Judy did. I haven't introduced you to Pip yet, have I? He was a little like Judy, only handsomer and taller, and he was 14 and had as good an opinion of himself and as poor a one of girls as boys of that age generally have. Meg was the eldest of the family and had a long flare, fair plait that Bunty used to delight in pulling. A sweet, rather dreamy face and a powdering of pretty freckles that occasioned her much tribulation of spirit. Now, if you're from a country other than Australia, you might have heard a word in there, plait. To me, it looks like it should be pronounced plate but it's actually pronounced plat. Now, I'm gonna give you the answer to this one. She had a long, fair plat that Bunty delighted in pulling. A plat is the word they use in Australia for a braid. So if her hair is braided, she has a fair plat. So there you go, I gave you the answer, shh, don't tell anybody. Okay. It was generally believed in the family that she wrote, wrote poetry and stories and even kept a diary, but no one had ever seen a vestige of her papers. She kept them so carefully locked up in her old tin hat box. Their father, had you asked them, they would have all replied with considerable pride, was a military man and much from home. He did not understand children at all and was always grumbling at the noise they made and the money they cost. Still, I think he was rather proud of Pip and sometimes if Nellie were prettily dressed, he would take her out with him in his dog cart. Dog cart. That's number eight, dog cart. I don't know what a dog cart is. So if you write down dog cart for number eight, you can look that up and see what it is. Must be something from a very long time ago. I've never heard of it. He had offered to send the six of them to boarding school when he brought home his young girl wife, but she would not hear of it. At first they had tried living in the barracks, but after a time, everyone in the officer's quarters rose in revolt at the pranks of those graceless children. So Captain Wolcott took a house some distance up the Parramatta River and in considerable bitterness of spirit, removed his family there. And number nine is Parramatta River. P-A-R-R-A-M-A-T-T-A. River, Parramatta River. Why don't you look up the Parramatta River and see where in Australia it is, how big it is, what's around it. They liked the change immensely for there was a big wilderness of a garden, two or three paddocks, numberless sheds for hide and seek, and best of all, the water. Their father kept three beautiful horses, one at the barracks and a hunter and a good hack at Misrule. So to make up, the children, not that they cared in the slightest, went about in shabby, added elbow clothes and much worn boots. They were taught, all but Pip, who went to the grammar school, by a very third class daily governess, who lived in mortal fear of her ignorance being found out by her pupils. As a matter of fact, they had found her out long ago, as children will, 
but it suited them very well not to be pushed on and made to work. So they kept the fact religiously to themselves. And that is the end of chapter one. Hope you guys have liked the story so far. Now you might be thinking, that was only nine questions and you said there was gonna be 10. So number 10 is to test your memory and see if you can remember the names of all seven of the children. Can you remember that? Maybe as a extra bonus question, do you remember the dad's name? I'll give you a hint, it was Captain Somebody. Okay, that's it for today. And I am dedicating this reading to two of my friends in Australia named Jack and Liam. No, they're not in Australia. Why did I just say that? They're in California. <laughs> Sorry, I have Australia on the brain. This is dedicated to Jack and Liam. Hi, guys. And I hope you'll tune in next time for Chapter 2. Bye.